All I'm offering is the truth. What happened to OT security? If you have been around in this field for a while, as I have, you cannot but shake your head in disbelief. I barely recognize the field I helped to create. What's going on here? Let's break it down. We can basically divide the evolution of OT security in three distinct stages. The first stage is what I would call the awakening. And it dates back to the late 90s when local area networks and TCP IP were introduced in factory automation. Back then, a handful of people discovered that asset owners and vendors had simply forgotten about OT security. Or they may not have even forgotten, they simply didn't see the problem in the first place due to ignorance or naivety. For the early point-to-point -point and field bus protocols, there was no real security issue because all access was local. Routing and the potential of untrusted devices on the network was not a thing. It became a thing with local area networks and then certainly with routing. Unfortunately, the whole automation industry didn't think twice about just taking the existing protocols and piggyback them on TCP. Big mistake. Add to that an attitude that could best be characterized by denial. When pointed to the problem, the standard answer was, but why would anybody want to attack us? Or these hackers don't know about industrial protocols. Or the classic, our systems are air gapped. Major OT security efforts in those days were awareness training and random risk assessments based on anecdotal criteria. That was pretty much what OT security was all about at the beginning of the 21st century. The close observer could grasp that an inflection point was reached when the OT security discussion became dominated by attention-hungry hackers who publicized a flurry of trivial and inconsequential vulnerabilities in industrial products. Something similar happened with OT risk assessments, where one could get the feeling that self-proclaimed consultants with zero experience in factory automation painted a falling sky, often in an attempt to attract some post-assessment mitigation project business. As predictable, such business almost never materialized because most decision makers were smart enough to see through the scam. If anything has a tradition in OT security, it's this shameless exaggeration of cyber risk and the underestimation of management to smell a rat. Things changed when more organizations agreed that risk assessments and a proactive approach to OT security were a good thing, but not in the random anecdotal manner in which they had mostly been done before. So in the next stage, which can be called the standardization stage, we see major standardization efforts with ISA 99 leading the way. In case you wonder, ISA 99 is what you nowadays know as IEC 62443. ISA 99 started in 2002, but barely got momentum in the first couple of years. With its very comprehensive approach, commanding substantial budget to execute for real, it was clear that it was mostly a thing for large corporations. The average manufacturing company or water utility simply didn't have the budget to muster an IEC 62443 implementation. That may have been one reason why more and less demanding frameworks and standards emerged, particularly the NIST cybersecurity framework in 2013. The main theme of the standardization stage is we understand what the OT vulnerabilities are and we can fix them in a long-term effort. We try to make this process more efficient by using standardization. It is difficult to find anything wrong about this in principle. A governance approach as mandated by pretty much every OT security framework has logic on its side. 
But that doesn't imply that it also has budget on its side as well. A comprehensive approach as suggested by IEC 62443 is labor intense and requires a sizable budget. But why on earth would top management want to approve a substantial budget and commit to hiring a bunch of full-term engineers tasked with nothing but audits and discovering even more cyber issues that need to be addressed, issues that you never knew existed and that require additional budget? Executives can be blamed for many things, but they are usually good at spotting activities that cost a lot of money and are prone to turn into something that's going to cost even more money for years to come. And then technology wasn't there to help. Well, at least not in a significant manner. The first OT security products in that stage were a couple of industrial firewalls that helped to filter traffic at a cell level extremely useful and rock solid, but not enough to move the needle for the big picture. And then something strange happened, which gets us into the third stage of OT security that is still ongoing. Pretty much overnight, a frenzy of new technical products emerged that turned out to be almost identical. These products are usually subsumed under the umbrella term ICS detection. Why so many products that all share the same value proposition, namely to detect the hackers in real-time network traffic when they strike? Why? ICS detection products would make a lot of sense if we would see attacks on industrial control systems every other week. In that scenario, asset owners could probably get a lot of benefit from detection technology. But cyber attacks on industrial control systems are so rare that there is no reasonable argument for a return on investment for an ICS detection product's whole life cycle. Real ICS attacks happen once every couple of years on a global scale, and that even includes unconsequential attack attempts. Now, let's assume you are heavily invested in this industry and the hackers just don't create demand. How do you deal with this unfortunate scenario? Well, here's the solution that the ICS detection crowd has found. Unable to point out hardcore proof of value, they want you to focus on imagined cyber attacks that their products could detect. How many times did you hear the phrase, imagine what could have happened after an attempted ICS attack that turned out to be a dud? Which brings us to the colonial pipeline hack. The ICS detection crowd is busy to market this incident as a striking reason why you should stuff your OT networks with ICS detection sensors. Unfortunately, it was lost to most observers that this argument doesn't have any logic because in the colonial attack, no OT system was compromised. Just think about it. Hence, no ICS detection sensor would have helped. But some vendors assume you are too dumb to notice this fact. Same thing happened before with Norsk Hydro, Maersk, Saudi Aramco and others, which are also used as examples for OT attacks, even though in none of these cases OT systems were affected. And that's the reason why I call this present OT security stage the travesty stage. Previous stages were rooted in technical analysis and sound procedural methodology, even where the respective approach might have been taken a step too far. We were still discussing facts, maybe even metrics and the technicalities of OT attack vectors and defense options. We did not try to create drama and engage in elaborate kabuki security theater performances. Fueled by millions of dollars of venture capital, OT security marketing these days solely aims at creating and exploiting fear. Is that sustainable? Probably not. 
when at the end of the day your value proposition boils down to reducing fear that you have instilled in the first place, you may end up in a position where you ultimately compete against Xanax, which sells for a much lower price.